speaker is Thomas Krajewski from uh, Ex Marseille University, and is going to uh, detail us uh, the loop vertex representation for random matrices. <clears throat> okay, so thank you very much, uh, Fabien, and uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for this kind invitation and to uh, also my collaborators, uh, Vincent and Vasily here for this uh, ongoing collaborations on uh, applying uh, the loop vertex representation to, to random matrices. So let me start by some very general considerations about uh, divergent series in quantum field theory. Uh, in the last centuries, uh, physicists have developed lots of uh, uh, machinery to uh, compute uh, Feynman uh, graphs. And in fact, uh, all this comes from a formal expansion of, uh, of the, say, partition function of free energy. So where is it? Yes. Okay. So uh, for the, for instance, the free energy in quantum field theory as a log of this uh, functional integral. So this can be readily computed. I put quotation marks because uh, it's not an equality. It's an inequality in a, in a sense that has to be to be uh, to be uh, better explained. Because strictly strictly speaking, it's not an equality. It's not an equality between two functions of G, precisely because uh, the series here, the sum over the Feynman graph, is a divergent series. That's not a problem because if you retain only a few terms in this uh, series, then you get. Uh, and you replace uh, G by what it is in, uh, in any physical application, you get something which is uh, in very good ag uh, agreement with the experiment. And if you increase a little bit the order of the computation, the <laughs> agreement becomes better and better. So even if the series is divergent, it's not something which is completely useless. Nevertheless, one has to be quite careful about what you mean by uh, this equality. In fact, it's just an asymptotic series. It's just an asymptotic series in the in a sense that I will precise. So <clears throat> you can try to trace the origin of this uh, divergence to uh, the factorial growth of the coefficient here. This factorial growth comes from First, a purely combinatorial origin, because you may have too many graphs that you try to add up, all with a weight which is proportional, say, to a power of the, of the uh, coupling constant. And then you may have some special class of graphs whose amplitude grow too fast. These are the so-called Renault Marons, and the first example is what is called the Encentos. So I will not talk about Renault Marons here, because Renault Marons are related to the fact that we renormalize the theory, so that we work in a, in a, in a say, just renormalizable theory in the critical dimension. And there are techniques known to deal with this, but I will not talk about this, because here I will uh, remain in a finite dimensional integral instead of a full path integral. and. Therefore, I will only deal with what is called the instanton. So one question you can uh, uh, raise is, suppose that you, are been, you have been able to compute this uh, formal power series, which is an asymptotic series, using and are you able to reconstruct the function you are expanding? Because if you work in a finite dimensional setting, it is very clear that uh, that this is just an integral over <laughs> a real variable, so it's uh, absolutely well defined, uh, at least for uh, positive values of g. So, can you reconstruct that function simply from this perturbative expansion? That's one question you can try to to answer. Now, let me try to work out uh, the simplest possible case. So let's uh, consider a, a simple integral over one single real variable phi here. And let's assume that uh, 
the copy constant as a real and positive, uh, uh, that is real and positive in order to avoid any uh, any uh, divergence in the in the integral. And, and let's just expand the integral naively. So just uh, in, just expand uh, the phi four exponential of the phi four interaction and permute uh, integration and summation. That's a really simple exercise. And you find that you have uh, this kind of uh, integral, which is just a, a gamma function. And at the end, you end up with this uh, factorial growth. OK? And that factorial growth is uh, precisely what uh, uh, ray, what gives rise to to one of the of the problems, the so-called instant problem. Now, from a physical perspective, you could say, yes, OK, so we we do perturbation theory, but the theory is divergent. That's very bad. But no, of course not. In fact, it's it's very good that it's divergent. Because if the series was were convergent, then the function would be analytic in at the origin, uh, around the origin. And then it would make sense for strictly negative g, which is, of course, nonsense. Because if g is strictly negative, then this integral blows up. And there is no reason to converge. So. It's a good thing <coughs> that it that it's uh, divergent and it's uh, related to the stability of the model. Another way to say things is to say, okay, but we are going to expand uh, this. Indeed, g is small, but uh, phi may be large. So again, you cannot uh, inter you cannot interchange so easily uh, integration and uh, and summation. And if you try to do the, as a simple exercise to prove that that it's valid to inter to interchange summation and integration using, for instance, the Boyle dominated convergence theorem, you will not be able to do it because you will lack the the the, the, the necessary bounding function. Okay, so uh, let's be a little bit more. Uh, uh, explicit about uh, uh, Boyle summation. So suppose that you start with a, a divergent series of these types. The minus one to the n is crucial for having uh, Boyle summability if the a n are all positive. So suppose that you have a series like that, and you want to give some meaning to that series. So uh, a first idea is to say, OK, the coefficient is probably uh, growing as a factorial. So let's divide by factorial to have something which has a finite radius of convergence. So let's introduce that function b of s, which is called the Boyle transform of that series. Now, suppose that this is known. Can you reconstruct the function f of g that would correspond to summing that series? Formally, you can do it in this way, because uh, when you expand b of s using this, again, you, inter you interchange integration and summation, then the factorial n here cancels with the factorial n that comes from a gamma function here. So at least formally, this is very nice. So let's call that the Boyle transform, and let's further try to see how it works. <clears throat> Start in the simple case of that... Uh, uh, z, function z, not log of z, just z. So this is the partition function of that uh, very uh, simple model. So I just rescale uh, phi by the square root of g just to have a, a very simple uh, a very simple expression of this type. And now this guy can always write as an integral over s, an integral over phi with a Dirac distribution here. Uh, you see that at least formally, it's completely equal. Uh, not, uh, not only formally here, because everything works fine. And you can, therefore, by uh, identification, say, say that this is the Boyle transformation up to some powers of g. So you see that the Boyle transform can be expressed very easily in that case as a function of s. But now, if you want to uh, to re recover the function f of g using the inverse uh, Boyle transform, which is just a Laplace transform, then, of course, b of s must not be singular on the region of integration, which is uh, the half uh, axis, the positive uh, real axis. 
So you see that it's important to know where are the singularity of that of those functions. But the singularity of this function is easy to to understand because uh, as a function of um, of phi, then uh, you can uh, you you can express it using this way. And each time you have a zero of the derivative of this, you may have a singularity. And if the singularity corresponds to a real value of the action here real and positive, then you, you have some problems. So you are able to relate at this level the singularity of the Boyle transform to the classical solution of the equation of motion. And if those solutions have a positive action, then they are on the axis you have to integrate, and then you, you get some problem. So this is why it's called the instanto solution. Now, we are going to deal with this problem. And let me first recall a purely uh, mathematical result, which is due to Sokal, uh, which is an improvement of a former result uh, by uh, Watson. So let's assume that uh, we have a function which is analytical in a disk here, a disk tangent to the, to the uh, y-axis. Let us further assume that the function and the series here satisfy this bond. This bond doesn't mean convergence, but it means that at least it's an asymptotic series because uh, when I fix n and I take g to be small enough, then the, the polynomial here is a very good approximation of the function f of g. But because of this n factorial here, I am not able to conclude about a large n limit at fixed g. So suppose that I have this and this, then the theorem is that uh, the function b of s is well defined at least on a, in the disk centered on the origin in the boil plane, can be extended to a strip, and the integral can be used to define the function f of g. So this is what that theorem that we want to use. So if you want to prove boil summability of some of the integral, you have to prove first that bond, and second, that analyticity uh, property. So we are interested in, in uh, doing this in the case of uh, matrix models. So let's, uh, let me first recall a, a rather old idea of Vincent, which goes back to uh, more than 50, 15 years. The idea is, to try not to expand the partition function or any correlation function over all Feynman graphs, but only over a subset of graphs, which are trees. But the amplitude of each tree will not be a very simple mono monomial like uh, in Feynman graphs. It will be still an integral, which may be uh, more or less complicated to evaluate. But the question is not about evaluating, it's about bounding and this amplitude will be rather easy to bond. So the idea will be to express the partition function as a sum over forests. Forests are disjoint union of trees in such a way that the log is just a sum over trees. Now, the good uh, aspect of this uh, tree expansion is that the number of trees of a given order grows like a power of the order, while the number of graphs of a given order grows like a factorial. Therefore, if we can bound the amplitude as a power row, then you can have such a bound on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the tree amplitude, which is here, and then you can have a convergence of that. So this, the, the resulting ser series will be convergent. <clears throat> And then, however, as I said, each A of T is still an integral, rather complicated, but easy to bond. Of course, I'm going to apply this on a finite dimensional model. How do you apply this in a real quantum field theory? Is still an open question, at least for a realistic model. I think it has been done for a model in low dimension by, in particular, Z2, who who is here, 
but uh, for four dimensional quantum field theory, I think this remains still uh, uh, out of reach today. Okay. So let me apply that to random matrices. So what are random matrices? Just probability laws on space of matrices, which means that I will just uh, do the, the path integral over some, some matrices. I will take a, a, a potential which is of this type. So this is a quadratic term that will define for me the propagator. This will define for me an interaction. And matrices have an additional parameter, uh, the size of the matrix, which will play an important role in what follows. So the Feynman graph expansion, I should put quotations here because it's not better than what I uh, exposed in my first slide is just a sum over uh, Feynman graphs, which are here ribbon graphs, thanks to the uh, work of Toft and uh, others to, uh, that identify uh, the uh, the matrices with uh, with ribbons. So, for instance, if you take a trace of M cube, then you write that interaction in this way, and uh, the corresponding Feynman graphs carries uh, double indices, which are dual to a triangulation. And that is a typical uh, Feynman graph in a random matrix model. And you see that each internal line gives you a factor of n. Each vertex, each uh, propagator gives you a factor of 1 over n, because you have a n in the, in the kinetic term. And each interaction gives you a n. So that all that uh, conspire to uh, give you that uh, Euler characteristics, and you have the famous genus expansion. And these random matrices are present in many branches of physics, uh, two-dimensional quantum gravity, but also random Hamiltonian in statistical uh, physics, uh, many uh, different things. So now let's uh, continue. And let's state uh, our main result. The main result is that we have a uniform analyticity in a so-called Pac-Man domain. So we are interested in the free energy here as a function of the coupling constant here. And as a function of the coupling constant uh, in, in this uh, way, we will prove that uh, it admits a uh, perturbative exp expansion that will be uh, convergent in a so-called Pac-Man domain. So this is a domain which has a little opening uh, around the negative real axis. So the negative real axis is where you have the problem. It will not be possible to have a function that is uh, well-defined and analytic around the origin. So in the best case, we have a cut starting from the origin. But here, we are in general not able to close the Pac-Man. However, we can uh, go beyond this uh, y-axis. Furthermore, the more you want to close, the uh, smaller the radius is. So at the end, if you really try to close it as much as you can, then the, the radius here disappears. But that's enough to have uh, our uh, boil some ability because uh, it always contains a, a disk tangent to the origin. Yes? Is this now a real quality or is it again a It's a real equality. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or at least we hope so. Thanks for the question. Indeed, it, it, it is supposed to be a real equality. And in fact, there is no reason why it should not be, because in principle, we, we did some, some work uh, to, in order to prove that. Uh, because here, the AT of GN is not a simple function of G. It's a still complicated function of, of G. So at the computational level, we did not gain much. But at the analytical level, yes, we did, because this function is analytical in G, and the sum is convergent. So the result is going to be an analytical function of G. 
So let me uh, try to sketch how that works. So the first, uh, there are several ingredients. So the first ingredient is a so-called forest formula because we need to, to have a forest at some point. Uh, this was already expressed by uh, Razvan in his talk. So uh, that's the forest formula is in fact, it looks uh, rather complicated, but it's just a, 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 an extension of the, uh, of the fundamental um, identity of calculus. What is the fundamental identity of calculus? It means that if you have a function of one real variable, you can always write f of one as f of zero plus the integral from zero to one of the derivative of n. That's nothing more. Except that now you want to generalize that to several variables. So you consider a function phi, which depends on uh, n and minus n minus one over two variables, which can be interpreted as the edges of a complete graph. And then you are interested in having the value of the function for all parameters taking the value one uh, as a sum over forest. And uh, each forest uh, will be given a certain weight and that weight will uh, be an integral over the parameters related to the edge that, that are in the forest of that uh, function here. So for instance, if I take n equals two, I have just a function of one variable because there is only one edge in the complete graph with, with two vertices. And I have a sum over two forests because there are two forests. The empty forest, I don't take the edge. The full forest, I take the only edge. If I take the empty forest, then uh, there is no uh, integration, no variable or which to uh, reintegrate. So uh, all this takes a value zero. If there is one edge in the forest, then, um, then there is one variable, what, uh, a first derivative with respect to this parameter, then nu is, equal, is exactly equal to that. And you get the uh, fundamental uh, formula of calculus. The next example is to take n equals three. So you have uh, uh, three edges because you take the complete graph over uh, three vertices and you have three types of forests. The empty forest that again gives you phi, phi of zero. The forest with one edge that gives you this and uh, the, the links between uh, one uh, three and two three are empty because there is no way to link them in the in the um, uh, using the edges which are in the forest. So that's there are, you have three types of terms of this type, and then you have the forest with two edges. So you have a second derivative, and you have the two variables associated to the edges of the forest, and to the last edge you associate the infimum over all the paths in the forest that connect this. In fact, there is uh, only one path in the forest, but you take the infimum of the variables, okay? And now a good exercise, if you say, if you have troubles uh, getting uh, some sleep uh, during the night, and uh, please take this and try to simplify. So you start with the with a most complicated term here, and you separate the integration domain depending on the value of the inf. You have a second, second order derivative. You try to write the integral to do explicitly the integral to get first order derivative with integrals that you, uh, that you uh, add to this and, you, and everything will cancel up to phi of zero, zero, zero. And I can tell you that it works. If you do this at 10, around midnight, you are not finished, but you sleep. Okay. <laughs> yes, perhaps uh, perhaps that, uh, that would help. You may take more time. <laughs> okay. But no, it's not so difficult. The first time it's it's a bit annoying to do, but it's not so difficult. And there are proofs of, that, of those formulas. Okay. So let's... Let's apply this uh, to something like that. So we are interested in computing a, a, 
a partition function. This is a Gaussian integral. So here I have a Gaussian integral. C is a covariance, so this is a propagator, and I have a potential. So I'm interested in this. I first do the naive power series expansion. So I expand that. Okay. And I take the covariance to be first to be one. So I use a very simple Gaussian integral. Now I decide that in, when I look at terms of order n in this, instead of expanding, instead of integrating over a single variable, I will integrate over n variables with a covariance that does not distinguish the variables. Okay? So what I claim is that this formula is in fact equal to the integral over a single phi with v phi to the end and a standard Gaussian weight. In fact, you can, again, you can check it because uh, you can try, because here it's a bit awkward because the, the covariance matrix is full of one, so it's not an invertible matrix. So you cannot write it as a kinetic term because the kinetic term would be the, inver the inverse of that matrix. But you can add a little epsilon on the diagonal if you want, and then you will have a, a bunch of delta functions that will uh, set this uh, equality in the in the um, in the phi uh, equal to uh, phi equal uh, uh, that will set the equality here. Now the idea is that here you have c which is equal to one, and since you want to write uh, uh, this as a you want to write this as a uh, as a sum over a forest, then you are going to use uh, that uh, forest formula where uh, the parameter in the covariance, which are all equal to one, you will allow them to be some uh, real variables uh, over which you integrate. And, uh, and at the end, you are going to write this as a sum over forest. <clears throat> Nobody has anything to say. Yes, that's all right. I can continue. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, once I have done this, I have a sum over forest. I can show, of course, that uh, uh, if a forest is a disjoint union of trees, uh, then, uh, of course, if, the, if you have... Uh, disjoint uh, trees, then the everything factorizes because uh, in the formula you see that they don't talk to each other. Therefore, you can take the log and the log is going to be a sum over the trees, not over the forest, but over the trees. Again, you have to check the combinatorics because uh, combinatorics is not completely trivial. Uh, it comes from the fact that you have here a, a one over factorial n, and that uh, the uh, the vertices are labeled, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay, so then you have obtained that uh, very nice formula that uh, gives you the log of z as a sum over trees of amplitudes which are associated to the tree. Okay, so now uh, now we apply that to to the matrix integral. So I made a little change of variables which. Uh, I think is uh, more helpful is that uh, we just uh, we just uh, put the couple constant in front of everything instead of uh, keeping the the couple constant in, so inside the potential. If if the potential is a monomial, that's not a problem. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, let's consider that this is more fundamental than uh, the other one. Then you write that as an integral over uh, multiple matrices with a uh, here a kinetic term, so here I cheated a little bit because that C is not necessarily invert invertible, but uh, that uh, that uh, works fine. And since we are working with matrices, uh, you don't have only trees, but you have embedded trees in the sense that you have to distinguish uh, trees that differ by a rotation uh, of the various edges uh, around uh, each vertices. Now, in order to prove what we what we what we want, uh, we just have 
to do uh, two things is to count how many trees we have in order to 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 check that we do not recover the exponential growth that was so annoying and we have to bound uh, each uh, of the contribution uh, to the integral so let's uh, let's do this uh <clears throat> In order, I start with the bounding of the amplitude because that's uh, more interesting. And uh, it relies to some, well, it has been first uh, proposed by Vincent, but uh, you can, you can uh, interpret it uh, in the way which I think is, uh, is very interesting, which is based on the Morse Palais lemma. So if you take a path integral, like for instance, that one, here. So the most Pali lemma tells us that if you have a function around a critical point, you can make a change of variable such that that function looks quadratic, non-degenerate critical point. So that's uh, a, a, a rather interesting idea because you take no any path integral, you say the critical point is at zero, then let's make a change of variable in order to get a purely quadratic function around that critical point. So that, in fact, it looks like if you can change by simply making a change of variable, you can, you can trade an uh, interacting theory for a non-interacting theory because uh, quadratic means non-interacting. Of course, this is not so easy because when you do a change of variable, you recover a Jacobian. So you have to take into account a Jacobian. But nevertheless, you can change that interacting theory with a trace of m to the power 2p by a, a purely kinetic term of this type, plus an effective interaction, which is just the log of the debt of the derivative of m with respect to k. You can have uh, more or less explicit uh, functions for the case of interest. So since we want to reduce that uh, to a k squared, so it's good to make that change of variable. The change of variable is nice, at least if M is a, is a real matrix, because you can invert it, where T is a function which is called the Fuss Catalan function that satisfies that, uh, that, uh, that identity. And I'll tell you more about how you compute that log debt here, which is uh, going to play the role of an effective interaction. So again, uh, you can say that, well, uh, I don't see any point in, in doing this. Why? Right. Because you have changed a nice polynomial, monomial interaction for a very nasty log of determinant that you don't even compute explicitly. Yes, but this one is much easier to bond than this one because it's a log of something. So first of all, when you are going to, to write down the Feynman graph, you are going to derive that with respect to k. Look at, uh, sorry, that's what's, if you look at, uh, at the formula here, in fact, uh, you, when you do the Gaussian integration, which is here, you are going to derive the potential. So if you derive a log, then you get a one over function. And that one over function is much easier to bound uh, for the large value of the argument of the field. So it's, a, it's a not so, so completely uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of the point. So let's, let's see it uh, more in detail. Now, uh, there is a little complication is that because we work uh, with matrices, so let's, uh, let's uh, consider a formal uh, power series or analytical function M uh, of a matrix K. Let's see how you can uh, try to derive M with respect to K. So by deriving, I mean, I should be able to consider that as a function of uh, N square variable into uh, N square variable. So, <laughs> You can at least formally derive that. And because the matrices do not commute with the variation of the matrix, and the formula is rather uh, clumsy to, to write, but you can uh, easily understand that uh, using a, a tensor product. 
So we interpret that uh, derivative as uh, something acting on the tensor product uh, because, uh, in fact, this will act on the right and this will uh, on the left, and this will act on the right. So, in fact, delta m is a linear version of uh, that function that uh, acts on delta k, and this action is. Uh, modeled by multiplication on the left, multiplication on the right, and takes that form. And you can then uh, extend that to the Fuss Catalan function. And finally, uh, when you're going to take the trace of the log, uh, you are going to write down the effective potential here as a, as a sum over uh, the eigenvalues nu of the matrix K, which for the time being, still we, we still assume to be uh, to be uh, Hermitian. Yes. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> uh, here we have the first Catalan function, which satisfies that uh, uh, polynomial equation. You can get uh, this uh, power series expansion uh, around z equals zero. Uh, you get the ordinary Catalan uh, numbers. Uh, these are the full Catalan numbers. You get the ordinary Catalan numbers for p equals two. And that function has a lot of uh, interesting properties. One property is that it is analytic on the cut plane and it has a, um, a singularity on the on a part of the positive real axis. But on the rest, it is it is uh, it is analytic and uh, its behavior at infinity is well uh, understood. Uh, you have some bounds, so all that helps us to bound this uh, in a, to bound this uh, this thing in a really nice way when uh, included into that uh, more complicated formula here. So that uh, integral here. So everything uh, works. Uh, works quite fine. Now you still have to count the trees. So again, uh, that is classical. It goes back to the 19th centuries. And, and you find that the number of trees of interest is, is of this type. And then you can bound everything by uh, that is the number of trees. This is some, uh, well, I, I should say, I should put a, a, a constant here. This is the G of n that comes from uh, uh, the fact that uh, on a tree you have at least what g edges uh, so each edge will give me a g to the to the n the n factorial was uh, in the exponential so uh, all this is no longer factorial because uh, you have a 2n and you have n factorial n factorial so that uh, that cancel so here i should put a, a constant but uh, that constant is is, uh, is harmless. And now, strictly speaking, all this was uh, was okay for real values of G. Now, if you want to, well, you, you can of course extend it to 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 uh, complex values of G. But if you now want to uh, handle the case of uh, complex values of G, then there is an interesting trick: is to rotate. The, the integral, because if you look at uh, the integral we are interested in computing, uh, which is uh, in fact this one here. Yeah. So as for real positive real G, it's well defined. If you have a little exponential of uh, I alpha here, then you can try to rotate the contour of integration in the variable case, because this contour of integration is in fact uh, uh, a, a certain number of uh, uh, integration contour in in the on the real axis, which is embedded in the in the complex plane, and all the functions are holomorphic in in the variable new, so that works uh, quite uh, quite fine. Except that uh, you, you you nevertheless you have a little problems because. Uh, uh, when you try to rotate the contour in the in the matrix integration here, then of course you will uh, 
you will have uh, little problems because uh, the effective potential is no, not analytic everywhere. So it means that you have here an effective potential that depends on that uh, Fuss Catalan function, and that Fuss Catalan function has uh, a, a cut a, a, a around the real uh, positive axis. So you have to uh, avoid, no, well, you have to stay away from, from that cut. And that puts some restriction on the values of, uh, of the, um, of the uh, argument of the coupling constant you can, you can take. So to be a little bit, bit more explicit, so if we want to have a, a, a large range for argument of G, so we rotate the matrix integral. So here, I'm sorry, I should rotate the K integral, not the, the M integral. And we have two constraints. That should remain uh, positive definite. So the total, uh, the total uh, 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 real, real part of that should be a positive uh, definite matrix that puts some um, this uh, first constraint here, and then you should remain away from the singularity of the function t, which is on the real positive axis. So that puts this second constraint, and at the end, uh, when you combine this with this, so from this you you uh, you uh, take the value of alpha, and then you replace, you end up with s, which is a X, uh, the um, the um, proposed uh, bound. Now to bound the tree amplitude, that's uh, a little bit more complicated. I'm not sure uh, there is some point in explaining this here. I would uh, refer you to to the paper, or if you uh, really want to uh, to enter into the details, we can of course uh, discuss this uh, tomorrow, as uh, if you if you want. And at the end, we obtain the, the Boyle summability, uh, which follows from the Nevanida Sokal theorem, because I have obtained the um, analyticity in G. Then remains to prove the second part of the the second assumption of the Nevanida Sokal theorem, which is at uh, uh, the function minus uh, the uh, asymptotic expansion truncated at order n is bounded. But again, you can do this with trees because <clears throat> what we have done is that we have expressed log of f, log of z, as a sum over trees. Now, each, the contribution of each tree still contains the contribution of all Feynman graphs, which are drawn on that tree by adding extra loops. So by further expanding, uh, by further expanding uh, this function here, no, it was written, it was written, yeah. So by here, in fact, there is a typo. This is A of three because it's a, it's a sum of a tree, but this is still an integral over many over n variables where n is the number of, uh, of uh, vertices of the tree. Now, you can further expand that to get for each tree some terms which are of order, of higher order than g to the n. And this is done by adding extra edges. And you can again bound that by bounding the amplitude and bounding the number of uh, of uh, of uh, of um, of way you can add an edge to a tree. Okay, so uh, that allows us to prove the uh, the second assumption in the uh, in the on the bound of the remainder here, and at the end we end up with a boil summability of that uh, result. Now, of course, at some point you would like to to be able to do something similar in quantum field theory, but uh, we are far from uh, doing it. 
at least uh, for a reasonable quantum of field theory because we are going to encounter also the renal myron problem. But nevertheless, uh, if you proceed formally, you can just think about uh, about uh, about uh, uh, replacing, applying again the morse palais lemma, uh, then we trade this uh, complicated uh, by, for a quadratic, uh, purely quadratic action by a single change of variables, but you, you recover an effective potential as a log of that. But why not trying to, to, to proceed in the same way? It's a little bit more complicated, but some progress has have been done in the 2D case by uh, Zito Wang and uh, probably he will talk about this in, in his talk. And uh, that could also be applied perhaps to more complicated matrix models where you have an interaction, uh, 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 a non-trivial quality interaction like uh, gross Vulcanar models. Okay, so I think this is end of the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Thomas.